Mark, let me ask you something. Why are you so wise and you're fucking young? This is bullshit, man. Like I'm, <laughs> what the fuck? You're like a, like, I feel like I'm, when I read your stuff, I'm like, this guy's in his 60s. He's like, what the fuck is going on with you? I mean, I, it's crazy to me. I don't understand how you accumulated all this wisdom. And you're, I mean, some of this stuff is like that you wrote 10 years ago. Well, it, it, you know, I think wisdom is accumulated via fuck ups. And, mm -hmm. um, and I got a pretty good head start on fucking up. So, yeah. you know, maybe, maybe that's, maybe that's what happened. It's really <laughs> kind of, it, it's like, it, bl it blew me away. Like, and you know, I like a lot of people, uh, learned about you from the subtle art of, of not giving a fuck, which became a worldwide phenomenon and still does crazy numbers. I, I'm sure that experience in and of itself is insane to you. Um, or maybe, I don't know, maybe not, but, but, you know, in reading that you're like, Oh, this is like, it, it really was like the way, um, you were able to communicate like almost simple things, but in a, in a way that's easier to digest. And you find yourself nodding along, like when you typically are speaking to somebody that's older than you and wiser yeah. than you and, and giving you kind of a life lesson, you know? Yeah. And yeah. I mean, I don't know how you did that. Um, oh, well, I, I don't really know either, but <laughs> like the way I've always thought about it is like all, all of these, I mean, self-help in general, right? Like there's not, not, none of these ideas are really new. Like it's, mm -hmm the same shit that's been passed down through religion and philosophy for thousands of years. Like really what, what effective self-help is, is it's finding ways to remind us of things we already know, um, in new ways that stick. Yes. Um, and so I, I've just always seen my job, you know, not as like coming up with stuff, but it's like just taking these like important truths that we all kind of know already, but, Mm -hmm. you know, you know, forget when we're scrolling through Instagram for hours on end and yeah. like finding a way to like make them stick into people's brain. That's a really interesting way of putting it. I, I feel like that, um, I'm, did you ever read the, you read the, the four agreements, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I remember the first time I read that, I was like so blown away. And then somebody asked me about it and they were like, so like, what are they? And it was, it was like, like, be truthful with your words and like yeah. things that you already know. And you go, well, I don't know why it's leaving such an impact. And it's the way that it's being delivered to you. Like it's repackaging it in a way. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and that book is beautiful in its simplicity. Like, yeah, I think there's, there's something very pleasing about taking like very, like, you know, something like be impeccable with your word, like be honest, essentially. Like that's sure it sounds simple, but it's like so complicated in, in the course of your life. Like you end up in all these situations where it's very ambiguous, what honesty is or whether you should be honest or not. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, and so a brilliance of a book like that is, is just able to like take those complicated situations and make them feel simple. And yeah, you know, and like, I think that's where the value is. Um, it's funny too, cause you know, in this industry, um, you know, the writer or the thinker gets generally gets all the credit. Like it's, you know, you've got the whole guru model and, you know, people who get paid tens of thousands of dollars to stand on stage and talk. And it's like, we're, we're actually just like repackagers. Like it's not, sure. <laughs> nobody's, nobody's actually coming up with anything. It's just like really, really thoughtful and kind of brilliant, um, you know, it's like, it's like Apple, right? It's like Apple didn't invent any of the shit that they made. They just like packaged it better and made it yeah. better. Um, yeah. and like, like that's just, that's what good self-help is essentially. It's, it's doing it with ideas and like yeah. and how to apply them. Yeah. Totally. I mean, I think part of obviously like the brilliance of what you did is taking the ideas and the way you, I mean, it was written, it was described this way too, that it was like the self-help for the people that are like, I don't want to read that shit, yeah. but Part of it is, you know, the way you write, the language you speak. You, I feel like I'm reading, um, like a buddy typing me an email, or something, you know. Whereas yeah. every time I've read anything from self help before, 
it just there's 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 like a distance like a separation where you go this is i don't know more like a professor or somebody giving a lecture and totally. and your stuff feels much more personal because of just the way you write yeah it's funny when my last book came out it was reviewed in uh in the sunday times in the uk and it was reviewed by this like old stodgy like 80 year old dude and uh of course he hated it he thought it was trash mm -hmm. and he <laughs> but in the course of the review he described me he said manson is like the local town drunk who spent too much time in the philosophy section and like <laughs> I saw it. I'm like, wow, that's actually one of the best compliments. That's awesome. That's <laughs> I'm, good. I'm like, I'm like, that's awesome exactly, that's exactly what I'm going for. Like I'm the guy in the bar who yeah. has had, who has had a few, but you know, has read a bunch of stuff. And, and that uh, is, that was everything is fucked that he, yeah. uh, yeah. He said <laughs> that. About, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now you, I mean, you strike me as you, you did obviously for all the stuff you've written, it feels like you've consumed a lot right i mean like in other words read a lot and and yeah. digested a bunch of of information whether it's philosophy psychology so did you have that where you can like really big on that in your youth too yeah i've always been a bookworm um i i didn't always do great in school um mm -hmm. you know i was i was that kid in class who like was reading a book, but it was like the, a book that had nothing to do with the class, you know, like sitting yeah. in the back, like reading like a, you know, Marilyn Manson biography or something. Um, so I've, I've always been like very autodidactic and just read constantly, but um, I was, I was also, that didn't translate to like academic success all the time. Sure. <laughs> yeah. I, I got to tell you something, man. I, so in, in getting ready for this, you know, I, I had, I had not heard of, and, and I discovered, uh, models. Yeah. And I'm so fucking fascinated, like fascinated, <laughs> by it. fascinated by it in, in so many ways, like in, in so many layers, this was, uh, your, your first book. And I just want to make sure I, I read it's models attract women through honesty. Right. Yep. Yep. And, and I, I was like, Oh, this is like interesting. So I started reading it and I was, so many things uh, hit me. Number one was how I so wish that when I was 15, 16, 17, that I had this book yeah. to read it and how I feel like it would have changed my life. <laughs> and, 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 and also at 18 and 19 and 20 and 21 and 22. And then some of the, the lessons that I've, because I started reading it just absolutely captivated by it. I go like, oh, I, I learned, I feel like I figured out this at 36 or something, you know, or yeah, like yeah. I, it really, and also the fact that still one of my favorite things to do is have a conversation with a guy um, who's single or going on a date and, and just hear his dating stories and, and hear the psychology, hear his approach, hear what happened. It's endlessly fascinating to me attraction dating mm. i mean i'll watch a dating show especially like the more realistic it is like I, the like a reality show but not where it's like you know just to watch people like yell and scream at each other but to see somebody go on i love that world and i yeah. feel like you in this book break down something that is again you know i, I don't know why we ignored it for years which was, well part of it was just cultural that that we were raised or men were raised to be like stoic or macho or you know flashy like all that that generation and now things have evolved into you no know, be vulnerable and try to connect how in the fuck did you get to writing the, and you wrote that what 10 plus years ago yeah 2011 dude <laughs> i mean i mean so it, it's i i definitely um so I have a weird history with that world. Like, mm -hmm. I, so I was that guy, you know, the, the whole pickup artist thing happened back in what the mid two thousands or whatever. Yeah. And I was, I was in high school and college when all that was going on. And so I kind of like, like fell into that little world and, you know, cause I was the dweeby guy who couldn't get a girl to like me and all that yeah. stuff. And, um, and so I started reading a lot of those books and, digesting it and trying it out and it just it was funny because it 
it, some of it, you know, quote unquote worked, you know, it was like, mm-hmm. it, it would get me a date or get me late or whatever, but it just felt awful. Like it felt yeah. very, I felt like a car salesman and, um, and it took me a long time to kind of like put my finger on like why it felt awful. Um, and it was just, it, it's essentially, it's like most men's dating advice and a lot of women's, but not all women's, but most like 99% of men's dating advice up until about 10 years ago was very like status obsessed. It was all about like, you know, all right, you want to be the dude with a Ferrari and like the champagne bottles at the club, but you're broke. So here are like eight things you can do to, to make girls think you're the guy with the Ferrari in the bottles yeah. at the club. And, and it's like that, that is so pathetic on like so many levels. Like it's just very yeah. de- dehumanizing to, right. That's, to mi- that advice is like, here's how you can deceive people and yes. get them <laughs> Do you, you can manipulate them through these series of lies. Yeah. <laughs> like so that's it's, advice. it's essentially, you know, it's setting you up for failure because it's essentially yeah. just teaching toxic manipulation to people. It's also dehumanizing for the man himself because it, it's kind of reinforcing this bad belief that like a man is only worth like how much money he has um, yeah. or how many girls he sleeps with. Um, it's bad for the women because it, it, you know, encourages men to continue to objectify women and treat them as, you know, trophies and objects and stuff. Um, so it was just, it, it's a mess all the way around. And so I, I, it was funny because I kind of, you know, dip my toe into that world and was very dissatisfied with it. And I, I just became fascinated with like, why, why is this so dissatisfied? Like why, you know, I, you know, I was like 22 and I'm like, well, I'm actually getting laid now, but I'm less happy than I was when I was like the dorky guy who couldn't get a date. You know, I just feel like it's because all the relationships I had were so dysfunctional and so toxic. And so, um, but I think one of the things about you though, is just at 22, recognizing that I feel like most people, myself included, would have just been like, well, I mean, I'll just keep doing this. Like, (laughs) even if it doesn't feel good. Yeah. Well, and, and what it. I what I noticed too is that like the the other guys in that world felt the same way, but they just blame the women. They're like, oh well, it's, right. you know, you know, women like women are like they're crazy and yeah. they're selfish and they'll use you for things and stuff. And so it became like super sexist, and that didn't feel very good either. Um, so yeah, I just kind of like started probing like why you know where is the dysfunction in this? Um, and by that time I, I had started my blog and I was writing a lot about dating relationships and, and I was getting emails from a lot of guys around the world with their situations mm-hmm. and stuff. And, and I, I just slowly started kind of piecing together, like what a healthy relationship is. And, and, you know, there's, there is a lot of advice out there that's kind of directed towards women about what a healthy relationship is, but nobody, you know, when, when you go to a, like your random dude in 2010, you're like, Hey, Hey bro, you gotta be more vulnerable. Like the guy's going to laugh in your face. Like he's yeah. going to, he's going to think you're a joke. And, um, and so I kind of took it on myself as a challenge to how can I write this stuff in a way that like doesn't emasculate the male reader, like that it shows a guy, like you can be a emotionally healthy individual and respect yourself and respect women, but still be a dude. Like you don't have to like be a wishy washy, you know, you don't have to like cry during Pixar movies to like, was that a, was that a challenge <laughs> though? Was that a challenge to be able to communicate that idea? It was. And it, and it's funny because, uh, you know, I, I kind of wrote models, when I was writing it, I was like, I'm, I'm very confident that like, this is the way to be like a good person. And this is what this industry needs. Um, Mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm done with these people. Like I can't do this anymore. And so I'm going to write this book. I'm going to put it out there. And if it changes the narrative or changes the discussion, then great. Or I'm going to get, I'm just going to be laughed out of the room and fuck it, whatever. That's fine too. Um, yeah. And initially I was laughed at quite a bit, like a lot of 
people in that world thought it was a joke. They're like, can you believe this guy? He's telling people to be sissies and be vulnerable and be like yeah. open up their emotions and stuff. Um, and it took a couple of years to catch on. And, but I'd say by like 2013, 2014, it was the, the best selling men's dating, uh, dating book on Amazon. And I think it pretty much has been ever since. That's um, crazy. I mean, that is, I mean, yeah, it made sense that I, you know, wasn't, like I wasn't aware of it when it came out because I wasn't dating. But I mean, I, yeah. I just started to read that and I was like, oh man, I was just thinking back to like how insecure and lost I was, you know, like in dating. I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. And I was, you know, kind of an introvert and and just, yeah, just totally insecure. And then you run into like the that that dating advice that they were like you got to insult them kind of neg that be ne you know be like <laughs> yeah, what's up with your fucking teeth and then then she'll <laughs> like you and you're like oh that's real cool uh and then, and then people be like yeah that works i'm like yeah i can't do that man i don't know how to yeah. do that that's yeah. not for me doesn't feel it's, right uh, no th that what you what you wrote was like oh it feels like things that again like as i've gotten older you're like yeah that's just you mean be a person um, treat them like people show, you know, like, like be, it, I love everything about also, um, cause you look back on it when you were like, you go like, what was so undesirable about me? And you're like, Oh, it was all my neediness. Like yeah. my, I was just like this needy mess. Yes. Without totally. even recognizing it, you know? Yeah, totally. And it's, you know, part of my inspiration when I wrote that was very similar. It was, I wrote it when I was 27 and I'd kind of gone through, gone through this whole journey um, and been through all these disastrous relationships. And so I kind of looked at myself and I was like, okay, what, what do I wish 18 year old Mark? Like Would what, know. what yeah. write the, write the book that I wish 18 year old Mark picked up and read instead of like the game, <laughs> you know? Yeah, the game. Uh, and so that, that's what I went for. And, um, I'm still very proud of it. You know, and my favorite thing about that book, and it's funny because I remember I blogged this back then. Um, I remember I wrote this blog post back in like 2009, 2010. And I, and I wrote, I said, there is, there is not been a, there's still not been a true men's dating advice book because as soon as one exists, you'll know that a true men's dating advice book exists because women will be buying it and giving it to the men in their lives. Yeah. Um, and, it, and back then it was very much like men's dating advice was like, Oh no, you have to hide this. Like you can't let, like if a girl comes yeah. over, you have, you have to like put this like in the closet so that she doesn't know you have it. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm like, that's a red flag, man. Like if you're <laughs> like that, that kind of tells you a lot right there. Cause it's like, if you, if you had really, really good men's advice, women would be the biggest fans of it. And so sure. when eventually models started, landing on the radar of a lot of women. And I started getting emails from women saying, I bought this for my brother. I bought this for my son. I bought this for my, you know, my dad just got divorced and I got it for him. Um, yeah. And to me, that was the most validating thing is like, it, that's how you know it. It's correct. Is that the women are like dying for men to read this. Well, and I think, you know, it's one of those things that I'm sure still, would uh obviously hold up now and and the reason being is that there's so many dudes that need help that are lost yeah. that don't know you know i mean i it's oddly enough i find myself you know we, we have podcasts and predominantly male viewers and listeners and they ask all the time they ask for yeah. dating advice it just it's still a thing that like it's one of those universal things that like, i think that's why I, I always stay interested in it it's just it's like being interested in, in, um, you know, like how people communicate. It's like, I, yeah. it's, it's never not interesting to me. Well, it, it, what's fascinating too, is that, I mean, it doesn't surprise me, right? Like it's, it's one of the most fundamental human drives is to, yeah. is a romantic relationship. And, yeah. but what's interesting to me is that, you know, for, for generations now, it's been socially acceptable for women to kind of express confusion or frustration or doubt or ask for help. Um, but it has never been socially acceptable for men to do that. And and I feel like it's just now starting to be socially acceptable. Like it's, 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 um, you're seeing it more and more, like it's not this like underground thing that we have to like find like internet chat rooms <laughs> that yeah. nobody knows about. Um, 
but it, it, you know, it's like that desire is always there. Like it's, it's men, men are just as confused and frustrated and, and, uh, you know, compelled to have a relationship as women. Um, Oh yeah. And a big part of it, it's just, it is the, that our youth, you know, young people today are not tied and married to those ideas that like our father's generations were, which is like, you don't go to therapy unless you're crazy as fuck. And you know, you don't, (laughs) yeah. Why would you cry? And like, you just, you know, like you basically put on an act around women. Like it's all these, it's, it's things that they were raised believing, you know, but now, you know, young people go like, Oh no, like we, they, they roll their eyes at those ideas, thankfully. And I think, you know, in another generation, it will be something we don't even recognize. Yeah. For sure. When you, when you um, had this success of that, you know, I think the natural thing for most writers would be like, Oh, I should do a follow up just like in the same lane. Right. Like yeah. something about relationships only like what did you have that temptation to, to stay in there or were you being told like, what are you doing? Just write another, you know, relationship thing, like relationship advice. It's funny. I, you know, I very much had the, the opposite. I mean, first of all, you, there, there's really only so much relationship advice. Like you, yeah it doesn't really change or evolve. Like there's not, there's no innovation happening in, in the world of human relationships. Like we're pretty much emo- like built the same emotionally as for the last, you know, 10,000 years or whatever. Yeah. Um, but also I just felt like it was one of those things, like I had been, I had been blogging about it for so long and then models was kind of the culmination of all that blogging and, and thought. Um, I was just so done with the topic. Like I just yeah. like, I was very much like, I don't have much else to say. Like it, it it's, it's all here. Like go read it's that. Here. Like, it, yeah. you know, it's, um, it was also weird back then. Cause it's, um, uh, you know, being a self published book, you don't get that same. So for instance, with, when subtle art took off and became a massive hit, um, instantly the publisher began putting pressure on me. Like, so base, essentially write a subtle art part two. And, mm-hmm. um, and I had to resist that a lot and, and kind of fight for everything is fucked to be a different book and a, and a different style and, and have different types of ideas. Um, you know, when, when you self publish something and, and it takes a couple of years to take off, like you don't get that same feedback loop. Um, you don't get, you know, there's not a, an editor calling you up and, offering you a bunch of money to like write models 2.0. Um, right. So it was kind of, I was just kind of off in my own little internet bubble, like, you know, playing with new stuff. And, uh, I didn't really think about it. Yeah. I Do will say like- though, I, I'll just add on to that. I did a lot of women want me to write, write a version for women. And, um, and I, you know, in a perfect world I would, but I don't have time. <laughs> yeah. it's a lot of that's yeah. a lot of time so it takes a long time to write a book <laughs> yeah i mean even though i think um i read yeah i think it was when i was reading the models that you were able to crank that out initially really fast like three months yeah but it was bad like <laughs> man i was like i had no idea what i was doing um yeah. Yeah. The, the first version of models was, was terrible. Um, it, it's still like, I basically had like, I had dozens of readers emailing me with typos and grammatical mistakes and like, you know, shit that any even like half decent editor would have caught on a simple revision. Um, so it, it took about a year of updates to kind of get it to get it to where it was to get it to like a presentable state. Yeah. How long did it take you to write subtle? in it like when you set out to write it uh about a, about a year and a half a year and a half about a year and a half yeah all my books have been about around a year and a half did you okay because like we obviously know how big this became did you have any antis i mean you know you 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 had the experience of writing a book you spent your time getting this together i'm, I'm assuming when you're when you're done and it's ready to print, you're, you're happy with it. The publisher's like, you know, happy with it. Do you have any anticipation of like, Oh, I hope this does like 
okay, I hope this makes it onto a bestseller list. Like anything? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, my, my goal when I published it was, was to hit the New York times list. That was kind of like, yeah. you know, the big goal and it debuted it on the times list, which I was happy. And so anything from there was kind of bonus. Um, you know, it's funny in hindsight. So to kind of give a little bit of context, I, my blog really blew up in 2013. It started, I, I had a number of super viral articles and by like 2014, I was getting one to 2 million readers each month. Um, wow. And so, and I knew which articles worked. Like I knew which ideas were just like spreading like crazy. Um, so in hindsight, it's like, I shouldn't have been that surprised. I think at the time, out. yeah, I think at the time, you know, cause it was market tested. Like it was right. You know, we had seen that these ideas resonated with people and the way I wrote resonated mm -hmm. with people, but like, it's funny. Cause at the time I think just publishing was such a new world that I was so unfamiliar with. And I think also just kind of being the scrappy upstart blogger, like, you know, it's, it's like the New York times list was still kind of this like Holy grail, a very unattainable thing. Um, I didn't put two and two together. Like I didn't realize that the millions of people reading and sharing on Facebook would translate to millions of people buying in bookstores. Um, but yeah, in hindsight, it makes sense. Like, what I is it like? What is it, even though like in hindsight, what did it feel like when it was, you know, just like a verifiable hit? Do you remember, like, do you remember being like, does that affect you in, in, in any other way than just like, that's great? Well, it's great for a while. And then it fucked with me for a while. <laughs> um, so the funny thing about the publishing world, which I think is different than other forms of entertainment, like it's it's a slow burn, right? So it's like, if you have a hit movie, like you kind of know immediately it's a hit movie and people mm -hmm. start stopping you on the street. Yeah. With a book, it, you know, it takes months for it to kind of build and mm -hmm. the word of mouth to kind of catch on or whatever. Um, so it gradually happened over the course of like six or eight months and it got to number one and it hit a million sales and, and it just kept going and going and going. Um, and so it was, there was kind of this extended slow celebration of like, oh my God, it's like doing even better now. Um, yeah. But then there was like this inflection point at, <laughs> because it, it reached like such a crazy level of success that I, mm -hmm. it started freaking me out because I'm like, oh shit, I'm 32 and nothing I ever do again is going to do this well. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it actually became uh, a little bit demoralizing for a while. Um, uh -huh. and, and, it, and, it, and it the pressure started mounting of like, fuck, how do I follow this up? Like, what do I do now, you know? Um, and, and I didn't really know how to handle that for a while. Like it, it I think it messed with me for about a year and I, I had trouble writing. I had a lot of, I lost a lot of confidence in my writing. Um, uh, there's a lot of imposter syndrome going on. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was rough. And the funny thing about this too is like, I mean, I don't know if you've had a similar experience at any point in your career, but it's like, I, when it first started happening, like I felt like such a dumbass because I'm like <laughs> literally the, best thing that can possibly happen to an author is happening to you. Yeah. And like, and you're struggling to get out of bed in the morning, you know, yeah. like, I'm like, what is wrong with you, Bart? Um, but it's funny how many people I meet, particularly like in the entertainment fields who have similar kind of experiences of like definitely you know, their, their first big success. And they just, it, it just fucks with them big time. It fucks with you. It, it does. It, it's, it's, I've definitely experienced, uh, I mean, similar feelings, um, particularly after things have gone really, really well, you know, like yeah. huge, uh, tours and big shows and getting paid. And you're like, Oh wow, this is everything like you dream of. And then, I mean, the imposter syndrome sit, sets in and I go, I'm incapable of writing a joke. I don't know what I'm doing. What like all, all those same emotions. And 
it's funny because I don't know exactly how do I what like how to explain um getting out of it other than the the only thing is like I sharing that helped me like talking to other particularly comedians about it and then and then just being like essentially get, get like making myself get to work like actually do work get on stage finding um and that's the thing about like there's I don't know what it is for like writers necessarily but in comedy you go there really is nothing like a new bit like a new joke a new and when you see like when you're capable when you find yourself doing something new and it works and that feeling it's like the greatest feeling and that cures for me all those other feelings like it's the only thing that i know and then now the thing is that that feeling comes back. Like what we're talking about comes back. Like after a special comes out, you get like this crazy global praise for a special and you sit there and you're like, Oh, that feels good. And then you get like to the lowest point where you're like, how will I ever come up with a new hour? Yeah. But now that feeling is familiar. So in other words, I go, Oh, I remember that I felt like this last time and the time before. So even though I don't feel good about it, I'm like, I know I can get out of this just because I've done it before. Yeah. Yeah. That's it for me. That makes sense. And it's, um, yeah, ultimately I had to work myself. I had to write myself out of it essentially. You, you, that's and, a, you did the work. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it was funny too, because, you know, initially when I sat down, I was like kind of hypercritical and I was like, well, the fans expect this and my readers want that. And the publisher is saying this and blah, blah, blah. And, and like what really kind of broke the spell was I was like, okay, wait, fuck everybody. Like, what do mm-hmm. I want? to see on paper you know like what like what is exciting me at this moment like what ideas what 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 will what's challenging me artistically um and that kind of got me out of it but it's a weird thing man i i uh somebody a friend of mine called it um astronaut syndrome because uh um apparently you know astronauts once they go to space they come back to earth and they get super depressed because they're like wow i'm never going to do anything as interesting and, and cool as going to space again. Yeah. <laughs> that is very, that's very interesting. Yeah. I mean, it must, it must feel like that on a whole other level. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it is, it is, it's strange to explain that to somebody because they go like, isn't this great that all this yeah. great stuff happened? And you're like, well, yeah, but that's the thing is I think that people don't think about even when something is like really well received, and celebrated you still are just a guy and you're like yeah but i would like to just keep working i don't want to just yeah i'm not going to enjoy that feeling for fucking a year man like it's it's, it's, you know (laughs) it's a fun week or whatever you know it's like it's ready i'm ready to go like it's time to go yeah it's weird how uh, you know i think people like the creator of uh, being the creative art, you, you experience your, your work in a completely different way than everybody else does, you know? And so I think people often project how they experience your work onto you. They like assume that you must be just as thrilled and happy as yes. they are. Yeah. Um, or that, 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 that happiness is as constant and like persistent as theirs is for you. Yeah. Um, whereas like on the inside, like, and you're just like, you're doing loop-de-loops and you're fucking oh, yeah. up one day and down the next. And oh. it's hard to explain that to people who like, don't live it, but yeah. And he also like, and like uh, for, for what I do, you know, like when I, I'm on tour and you're doing hundreds of shows, you always want that audience. I got to want to tell the audience that I did, I'm not enjoying this or, uh, I, <laughs> it's like, I'm trying it's like, to hey guys, figure, I'm having an off night today. Like <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to figure out this bit and it's just not landing. And I don't like you guys. <laughs> like, I can't fucking say that you always want to be like, that was great. And that was fun. And a lot of times it is, yeah. but you know, it's a, it is, I mean, look, thankfully actually that it's a, it's a ride and it's up and down because that's what makes it kind of a journey, you know, is that not just this, like this all the time, that wouldn't be, I don't think that fulfilling creatively. If you're just like, yeah, whatever, man. Like I like that, you know, the fun thing about comedy, at least live comedy is that you take a risk 
And the higher the risk, the higher the, you know, the, the chance that you could either fail horribly or hit like a fucking grand slam. And yeah. you have to, you know, if you're not taking the risk, you'll never get those monster laughs, but also you can fucking bomb. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. It's scary and exciting. Um, yeah. I was thinking about like one thing in, in subtle that it seems like, again, like so simple, right? It's just like a simple thing that I'm 42 years old right now. And I find myself having gotten much better at it, much better at it. But I still think it's something that I work on to this day is recognizing, um, oh, that's not for me. And I don't want that. Yeah. But and, and now I'll, I'll act on it, man. I, I don't think I really started doing that until I was in my like, I don't know, late 30s or something where I finally yeah. was like, oh, yeah, I, I don't think I actually want that. I think other people want that or I think I want that. But now yeah. it settles in. It's amazing that you were able to grasp that concept at your age well the concept's easy doing it's fucking hard doing like, it yeah. I, <laughs> like i i still i still struggle with that i mean i that's the thing about a lot of these concepts too right it's like it's you know so so what you know what you're referencing i, I talk about how like the saying no is a skill like it, it's, yeah. it's it's a skill you you learn and develop throughout your life but like any skill like you're never done with it like you're never like you know, oh, nailed it. Don't have to yeah. like work. You know, Later. it's like you, yep. you, you never have to stop. You like, you always have to keep working on it. And, um, and it's funny cause it's, 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 uh, it's something that I continue to work on. And it, it's been interesting too over the last few years. Um, you know, cause you know, with the breakout success of, of subtle art and everything, like all these very shiny and sexy opportunities come through the pipeline and, uh, things that, you know, I've never been exposed to before opportunity, you know, and you, probably once in a lifetime top type opportunities. And I just started saying yes to everything. Um, and I've kind of hit that point. Like actually it was with COVID that really showed me, I'm like, wait, I don't actually like doing like 90% of this stuff. Like yeah. <laughs> the, the thing I like doing is sitting in a room by myself with a word document. Like that's, still the the thing that i enjoy the most um so why am i saying yes to all this shit like why am i still like doing all this stuff um so it's yeah it's weird it's like weird turning down shiny and sexy things um and the, and that happens more like because it's happened to me uh, also more the more successful I, i've become the more of those opportunities some of them are opportunities that you'd heard about you know like before yeah. you ever had a chance and you're like Oh my God, if that ever were to come up, you know, and then it comes up and you're like, Hmm. And I, I think the fact that you have doubt when that sexy opportunity arrives is a, like a, something to listen to. You're like, why am I feeling like immense doubt about this in this moment? You know? Yeah. And then, yeah. I mean, the only, the, the, the reverse of it for me is that if something I feel, if I'm scared of something, I try to investigate why I'm scared. And sometimes like, It'll be like if it's creatively re related, like let's say I get invited to do a show and it's like a particular crowd that I know is going to be there. And I'm like, Ugh. And I feel like fear. Mm -hmm. I, I'll stop. And I my my immediate reaction is like, stay away. But then I go, oh, you know what? The fact that I'm kind of scared to perform at that show is telling me that maybe I should go perform at that show. Like those are the things uh, I, I absolutely. try to say yes to. Uh, I try to say no if I go, I start thinking about everything involved with what happens if I say yes to this opportunity and I go like, yeah, but none of it's appealing to me. I don't want to be in that room. I don't want to be on that set. I don't want to be like, I'm not yeah. saying no because I'm in fear. I'm saying no, because I know I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not going to enjoy this experience. It's going to take me away from things I enjoy doing. Yeah. And, and it's weird too, because I think, uh, you know, when you're young and you're starting out, and I, I think this is probably true for any career, you know, like you need to say yes to everything. Like you need yeah, to, yeah, of course you, you need to say yes to every opportunity that comes and take a chance on, you know, take every shot you get. Um, but then like paradoxically, like the more successful you get, the more you have to like train yourself to start saying no to more and more things. 
Um, and it's hard. I remember like, <laughs> I was like, I was at, uh, I got invited for like some speaking gig it, out in Switzerland. And like, I was, I ended up in this room. It was so funny. So one thing that happens to me a lot is a lot of like kind of conventional, what I call like woo woo self-help people. Um, mm-hmm. you know, people who believe in like spirit crystals and that like the yeah. chi is controlling the world's, you know, whatever. Um, they're really into my shit and they think I'm one of them. Even, even right. this, despite the fact that I explicitly make fun of them, like throughout my work for throughout. years and years. Yeah. And years. Yeah. Um, they think I'm one of them. And so I found myself at this conference in Europe and I'm sitting in this room and we're like doing like, you know, spirit energy exercises by looking into each other's eyes. And I just remember like thinking to myself, I'm like, I got to start saying no to more shit. Like, <laughs> Like, what the fuck am I doing here, man? Yeah. <laughs> like, it was, like, it was a big eye-opening moment for me. It's like, man, I just yeah. got to, I got to start turning these things down. Like, what, a, what's going on? <laughs> yeah. And then like, you feel like, I mean, those, those, you need those. And you, you get, for me, it was like going on to um, a show, a set. And I was like, I, this sucks. It's taking up this much time. I don't want to be here. And even at the end of it, I don't like, it's not like you go, well, it sucks, but it's worth it. It's like, yeah. you, I felt like this sucks and it's not worth it. Yeah. I, I didn't enjoy any part of this. So now I don't know. It's always in my head now that like when, when an opportunity arises, really examine whether or not it's, it's going to be something you're going to enjoy doing. Yeah. For Huge sure. lesson for me. Um, another thing that you, like you, touch on a lot. And I feel like it has grown so much more since you were writing about it is how many, like the world is overflowing with entitled people. It is to, a, there's a, a fucking another pandemic and it's entitlement. It's like, it's to a point where I, I mean, I, I don't have the vocabulary to describe it, but it's, it's like we have become a society of entitled people. Yeah. It's funny. I started write, I started writing an article in the middle of the pandemic called "The Entitlement Virus," and it wow. was, you know, I was going to use, you know, coronavirus as like a metaphor for because it's. I mean, I agree with you. It, it's, and what's funny is like, I get, so you know, I, I write a lot about entitlement and how it, it seems to be a growing phenomenon in in our culture and we're more exposed to it through social media and everything. And it's so funny because I, I get emails from people and I get it from people all walks of life. So old people, young people, people on the right, people on the left, people like, uh, you know, it, just everybody, religious people, atheists, like, and everybody's like, yeah, Mark, you're totally right. It's all those other fucking people. Who right. Are right. Entitled, you know, and uh, like, yeah. yeah, exactly. And they're like, man, if we could just, you know, all these fucking lefties or all these fucking righties, like they're so yeah. entitled, blah, 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 blah. And you know, it, it's, it should be like this, that we should go back to this, this arrow when these things happen. And I'm like, you realize like this email is like perfectly encapsulating what I'm talking about, <laughs> you know, like there's, and no, it, they don't, they don't realize. No, that. they don't get it. And yeah, and it's, yeah. there's one of my favorite quotes ever is that David Foster Wallace. He said, uh, he said, the thing about evil people is that they think everybody else is evil. And, um, and, and so it's a, a lot of like what I've been focusing on the last year or two, especially through, through the pandemic is just like humility. It's just like, trying to like remind people like you know like you don't know what's going on man like nobody does like we don't it's gonna be five years before we like figure out what actually the fuck happens here um yeah so like just chill out for a minute (laughs) you know and like let let there be a little bit of uncertainty like be willing to sit with a little bit of it um it's been hard it's been really frustrating do you feel like because one other thing that I that popped really big in the last uh, five six years that I don't re- I don't recall seeing this level of it in my youth and 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 that is the like the level of vitriol people have for one another um, for people who don't agree on ev- like all of their beliefs. 
Um, yeah. Like when you talk about lefties and righties, I mean, obviously like that's a, a big one, but people now go like, you know, like I remember I went to, uh, I was in LA when I was living there not long ago and I got invited to go to um, a gun range that is outdoors. That's incredible. And it's where a lot of the studios send their actors to prepare for, um, you know, like for movies, like action roles. Yeah. 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 Keanu Reeves trained there for John wick and Michael B. Jordan went there and Kevin Hart and Halle Berry. But anyways, I got invited to go. It's fucking so fun. Right. Mm -hmm. So I did like a couple of posts about it, like just on Instagram, like here's where I am. It's called Terran tactical. And it was amazing to me that some people were like, like their, their comment was, uh, well, you just lost a fan or like, uh, didn't know you were like this. I'm like, didn't know I was like, what? Like (laughs) having fun at a range. Um, like they interpreted it as pro gun, which, you know, I'll just say, I'm not trying to make a statement by posting this video. It wasn't like a pro gun or anti gun thing. It was like, I'm at this awesome place having this incredible experience to me it more like that. Those types of comments symbolize to me, like the way so many people are today where they're like, Oh, you, that's what you say about this. Then I'm putting you in this category. You, yeah. you sit here for me from now on. And I just feel like, I don't know. 15, 20 years ago or something that it wasn't really as people just were more like, Oh, you, you like to do that too. Or that looks cool. And yeah. now it's people have to know they have to put you in that, that label on you. If they, if they figure out something about you. It, it, yeah. It's like, you know, when you like, you go to Starbucks and like they fuck up your order and yeah, you know, like yes. you, <laughs> and you go up and you like, bitch and complain and you're like and i demand like through the fucking register yeah yeah exactly oh, it, yeah. you know it's it's like people are adopting that attitude for everything in the world like it's yeah. like it's like oh this comedian i like likes guns like i'm gonna yeah. let him, i'm gonna show him like how wrong he is you know it, it it's um i think there's it's 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 a it's a it's kind of a toxic behavior, you know, look, and we've all got a little bit of that in us. Like we're all, of course. we're all a little bit like that, but like, I think one social media kind of enables and rewards it, you know, just because, uh, just because of the nature of how the algorithms work and everything. So I, I think it's what ends up happening is the, the people who are the most whiny and entitled end up with the biggest bullhorns. And um, I actually wrote an article about this, a few months back, um, I talked about how it, it's like, if you really look at the data of how, like the content that's produced online and then what actually gets shared and like kind of the, the degrees of how much something is shared or, or viewed, um, what, what we're really seeing is like, there's a silent majority of mostly reasonable people in the middle. Like, it's like, you, you know, you posted that thing to Instagram or Twitter or whatever, you know, yeah. it's probably like 90% of your fans were like, oh, cool, cool, yeah. you know, whatever. Or even like the fans who are like not in the guns, like I'm not in the guns at all. But if I saw them, I'm like, uh, whatever, like yeah. some people are in the guns, you know. Yeah. But what happens is, first of all, the people who don't care much aren't going to be willing to post something. So you, you just never hear from them. And then the the minority like the 10 percent who care enough either way to post something you know it's it's going to be like the whiny bitchy people who the algorithm rewards um, yeah because that's what people engage with um it's really fascinating when i was doing research for this article i i found um like people who have researched social media and like how stuff is disseminated like they they came up with something called the uh, the 99 one rule, which is basically what they found is, um, 1% of people on social media produce 90% of the content, 9% of the people engage with that, with the 1% who are creating 90% of the content, usually agreeing or disagreeing or arguing about it. And then 90% of people just don't fucking care and like never post anything. And so, 
Uh, there's these kind are of, the real stats. Yeah, and it's like so. You, there's what gets lost and what people don't realize or forget is like, you know, it's easy to go on Twitter and just see like this fucking dumpster fire of a political argument and and lose all faith in the planet. But like, what you're missing is that there's this massive, silent, invisible audience that's 10 times bigger than the people posting. Sure. Um, that agrees with you. That thinks is like, this is stupid. Like what, yeah. what's wrong with these people? You know, they're just not uh, commenting that like, I don't count one of my, cause we were talking about this. We've talked about this endlessly among comedians, right? Cause yeah. you, you have jokes that can really. Oh. And you guys, you guys can get fucking hammered for shit. Oh, yeah. Like if you, if you say the wrong thing or it's taken out of context, like I'd be, mean, your career can get fucked up. Well, we've had it happen. I mean, like myself and, and friends have had it happen many times and you go like, well, you know, you start reading comments and it's like, well, we started talking to each other. I mean, I remember I had a conversation with one friend and was like, he was like, yeah, but who he's like, who's writing these comments? And I'm like, well, people, and he's like, yeah, but he goes, do you write comments like on YouTube? And I was like, no, he was like, yeah, of course we wouldn't even be friends. Like, yeah. Like, <laughs> like, like, you have better things to do. <laughs> yeah, what, who do you know writing comments? And I was like, yeah, that's true. And, and you get, and then you start to go like, if you start to pay attention when something flares up, like I've, over the last year, all these comics have had a thing. It gets the attention and you start going, Oh my God, what? And you go, just watch, wait, whatever, a day, a week. Mm -hmm. And it's like a noisy explosion of comments of like that 9%. Yep. And then it's like, most people don't know what you're talking about. Don't care. Uh, I've brought up, you know, something that like w inflamed audiences to, executives and they're like i have no idea what you're talking about like they don't they don't register it most people are just like yeah i'm, I'm not in that nine percent yeah yeah I, you forget I, feel, it. I feel like what what uh what we're starting to realize um slowly is is that you know it, it's social media is not our an accurate reflection of reality and it's 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 like a funhouse mirror of reality like it's it yeah vaguely resembles what is actually happening in reality, but it distorts, it amplifies certain aspects and diminishes other aspects. And, um, and I think that's kind of like, you know, one thing that I've written about for a few years now is just advising people to like, I call it the attention diet, which is basically, you know, the same way you kind of restore your physical health by restricting all the crap that you consume. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you, you can restore your mental health by restricting all the crap information you're exposed to. And so, um, you know, I kind of have this like step-by-step -step thing of unfollowing lot, you know, lots and lots of people and limiting how, yeah. you know, how often you use your phone and how often, you know, which social media platforms you get on or how long you're on them or whatever. Um, and it's funny cause like the most common experience people have when they kind of go through this process of like just relinquishing their social media engagement, uh, is they feel liberated. They're like, you know, cause it's, there's kind of this weird irrational fear of like, Oh my God, but if I'm not on Twitter every day, then like, I'm going to miss out. Like, I'm not going to know what's going on. And then it's actually the opposite happens. It's like you, you get off and you're like, wow, the world's fine. And actually like, yeah, like there's a lot of better things to do. You know, it's like, you yeah. actually go do things like engage people face to face. So, um, Mark, can you please, like more clearly write this article for all of us to share and have it go <laughs> with a lot of statistics. Yeah. I mean, check it out. Attention diet. It's on my website. Check it out. Attention yeah. Diet. It, I, yeah. It's, it's, I've been like a, a fucking, you know, you know, like that, the guy who stands in the park with the Bible screaming at people like yeah. the, 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 I'm that with the attention diet the past two years is like fucking unfollow like 80% of the people you follow delete apps off your phone. Like, it's your life. I had better. a, I got, I had, um, like I would call it like a, my, my, like a, a diet, like the sickness, um, attention sickness that I had a cycle where mm -hmm. I would go, man, it was so fucked up. I would take my phone and I would go Twitter, da 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 scroll, close yeah. Instagram, close YouTube. Yeah. Close. And then emails like to see what emails, then I'd close it and be like, yeah, 
that's too much of that. And then I would go, well, what's going on on Instagram? Though? Like I would go back to one of the ones and <laughs> yeah. think that I had, and then I would, yeah. and I would go through them over and over and over. It yeah. Was, that was, those are the worst kind of like cycles to be in. Yeah. It's, I, yeah, I've been there. It's crazy. Like I remember back in the day, back when Facebook wasn't fucking horrible. Uh, I remember I would be on yeah. Facebook for like an hour and then I'd open a new tab in my browser and like instinctively type in Facebook. And I was just like, this is yeah, really what fucked am up. I do. Yeah. It's yeah, fucked up. Is, yeah. And, but it, it's, you know, part of the, you know, like the first thing I always recommend is I say like, you know, however many people you follow, like, set a goal, like unfollow it like 80% of the people you follow, like just start. Why, with that. why that? Why do you, why is that a good thing to do? Uh, it, well, so it's just, first of all, it's a, it's a loose play on like the 80, 20 rule, which is this idea that like 80% of the value that you're probably getting from social media, it's probably from only like 20% of the people you follow, like uh, all, all the junk and bullshit and distractions are probably coming from everything else. So it's like really like limit yourself to following only people either you really, really care about or really, really respect um, or who like make you feel good or make you happy or yeah. whatever. Um, but the other, the beauty of that is like, once you like pare down how many people you follow, you, you, what you find is you can't do that cycle you were just talking about. So like the reason you can do that cycle you were just talking about is like, if you, if you go 20 minutes without checking Twitter, but you follow like 800 people, 20 minutes, there's a whole new batch of content yeah. to go look at. But if you only follow like, you know, 20 people or 40 people, 20 minutes isn't enough for there. You like, you go back to Twitter and there's only one new tweet and you're like, okay, yeah. well, I guess it's time to close Twitter until tomorrow. Cause that's kind of something you know, else. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, you, you kind of just, it's, it's to go back to the food analogy. It's like limiting the portions on your plate. Like, you know, ob it, obviously if you just, if somebody puts a plate with like 8,000 calories in front of you, you're, you're definitely going to eat a lot. Um, yeah. whereas if they put a plate with, you know, say 800 calories in front of you, then you're, you have a much better chance of being like a, having a healthy portion. Dude, I love that analogy. And one last thing I wanted to ask you, cause I, I'm assuming because it's, um, out there, we can talk about the fact that you're writing with, with Will Smith. Yep. Yeah. Um, Tell us a secret. What's his penis look like? Like, tell us something you don't know. <laughs> um, oh man, dude, you you just like, like <laughs> you like I mean, scramble you scramble my brain with that one. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's uh, it's like, how do how do I follow that up? <laughs> it's like it's it's so cool because he is you know. He's such an iconic guy. And I, yeah. I, um, I think about, you know, man, for, for the field of entertainment to have done what he's done yeah. like, over the course of decades now and reinvent himself and just, I mean, hit the levels of the success that he has. And like, even in the last year, he started doing more um you know like vlog stuff i mean like you yeah. know youtube and you go like even that stuff just knocking it out of the park just like I, I just find him to be an endlessly fascinating inspiring you know entertaining dude and and yeah. like i'm ex i'm excited that you guys are paired up yeah so yeah his team reached out he's wanted to write a book for a while um and his team reached out and i met up with him i think 2018 um hung out with him for a weekend, you know, and kind of going into it, like I, you know, I never really like aspired to like write co-author like celebrity memoirs or whatever. Yeah. Um, but you know, he's Will Smith. So like you take the media, yeah. um, yeah. but like when I, so when I, when I went in, when I went in to meet him, you know, I, I kind of had two, two questions, like two conditions in mind to, to take on the project. The, the first one was, uh, he can't be an asshole. Like he's got to be a good, yeah. like, I'm just not going to work, work with an yeah. asshole period. Yeah. Um, and then two was, I felt like he really needed to like want the book for the right reasons. Like it can't, it can't just be like another trophy for his, his mantle or mm -hmm. like a PR strategy or, or whatever. Um, and so when I met him, like he's the sweetest dude, like honestly, 
he's so much cooler than he has to be. Um, yeah. I saw him. It was funny. The first time I hung out with him, I watched him like walk through a hotel lobby and just get mobbed by people. And I was watching him. And I'm like, man, he's nicer to his fans than I am. Like, yeah. <laughs> and like, and, and like, he's fucking Will Smith. He gets like bombarded every day for the last 30 years. And I'm like, wow, I should be like, I should be better to my fans. Um, <laughs> and, and, and I, like it, it, he, I found him personally very inspiring as a professional of like, this is how you, um, you know, this is how you deal with an audience. This is how you deal with your team. This is how you collaborate. Um, he was, uh, I really, really look, look up to him in those ways. But, you know, when I sat down to, with him and I was like, you know, why do you want to do this? He, he basically told me, he said, look, like being an A-list celeb, especially in the, the 90s and early 2000s, like you're constantly hiding yourself from the world. You're like running away from paparazzi and you're like, yep. you know, you've got all this fucked up stuff being written about you and tabloids and stuff. And he's like, so you, you're constantly like putting distance between yourself and the world. And he said, like, the world's changed and I can like control my relationship with people now. And he said, I want people to know who I really am and how I really am. And I want them to know my life. Um, the things I've been through, like people, I mean, he's been through a lot of shit. Like he's that, and he's never shared that before. Um, so I was like, fuck yeah, dude, that's, that's awesome. I'm, I'm on, if that's the goal here, you know, um, kind of that vulnerability piece that we were talking about, yeah, like, sure. I, I'm in. And, um, and it was a blast. And, uh, I wish I could give you like some like nitty gritty dirt or whatever, but like, it's just fucking cool, dude. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's just, I really believe fun. it. I believe it, man. <laughs> it, uh, and it was your process. Like you have to like, you have to talk a lot. You have to hang out a lot. Yeah. Right. Or, or yeah. you guys just like spoke a lot. And yeah, I mean, I came into it just being a very kind of casual Will Smith fan. I didn't really know a whole lot yeah. about him. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I, I told him, I was like, well, you know, step one is I basically need to like download your life into my brain. And yeah. so I, yeah, I traveled with him on and off for about a year. I met all of his family, a bunch of his friends, childhood friends, um, hung out with Jazzy Jeff, like met uh, Alfonso Ribeiro from Fresh Prince. Like it, it you know, it just like, crazy shit. Um, yeah. and, and just like collected all these details and stuff from his life. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, the thing I would say about him that I think people don't realize is, um, you know, he is, he is, has this unbelievable gift of just charisma and kind of making things look effortless. Um, yeah. he is maybe like the most resilient individual I've, I've ever met in my life. Um, you know, one of the, one of my first conversations with him, he was telling me about his childhood and he was like, yeah, when I was nine years old, I saw my dad beat my mom to the point that she started coughing up blood. And he said, and I was like, how did you respond to that? And he said, I immediately knew that I needed to be the adult in the house. And I was like, Jesus Christ, man. And and wow. he was like, I was, and he said, I knew one day I was going to have to take care of everybody. And so, and he was like, and by 18, I had a hit record and I did. And wow. I was like, fuck man. Like, you know, 99% of people would not react that way, much less For actually, sure. go, actually go do it. So I'm like, yeah. all right, dude. I'll write your fucking book. Let's, let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't wait to read that one too, man. And, um, dude, I, I really enjoyed this chat with you, man. Thank you so much for, for absolutely uh, dude. on. Yeah, absolutely. Hopefully we, uh, hopefully we can meet up sometime maybe down here at ATX or I don't know somewhere else, but uh, yeah. it'd be fun. Absolutely.